Welcome back to the Mastering Portrait Photography podcast. Hello and welcome to Mastering Portrait Photography. Uh, in this particular podcast, it is my absolute privilege and a genuine pleasure to be talking to a guy who is just one of the most interesting people I've had the chance to meet. This is Chris Coos, who is the Technical Communications and Training Manager for Hasselblad. Now that, that is a snappy job title. And you have to kind of understand that I've always sort of had a bit of a love affair with Hasselblad, my sort of all-time go-to photographer, the guy whose work I'm, I've always loved and have been influenced by is David Bailey. And of course, from much of his career, he had a Hasselblad in his hands. And so I've always had this sort of thing about it, although I'm Nikon through and through and I've been for many years. Uh, it's, I've been lucky enough to have a play with a couple of the Hasselblad units and they are every bit as good as I hoped they would be. Um, and so when I got the chance uh, to talk to Chris Coos, he actually came over. I first met him because uh, Hasselblad very kindly uh, lent me an H6D and an X1D, two cameras that I still have to do a podcast talking about. But trust me, it was a real thrill for about a month, six weeks, to have these two, uh, two cameras in our portrait studio. Uh, unfortunately, with the, the X1D in particular, uh, we had a couple of technical glitches. These were pre-production or early prototype units. Um, and uh, Chris and uh, Mark Whitney came out to the studio a couple of times to help me figure out quite what was going on. And so I got to chat to, to Chris and we just got on really, really well. And I really enjoy not just the fact that he's a nice guy, but the fact he's incredibly knowledgeable, really, really a deep knowledge of photography in general and, of course, the specifics of medium format photography, which is really where this podcast is headed. And the interview kind of slides in. Uh, normally, I give a nice big sort of, hi, give me your name, give me your job role. And I failed miserably to do that because we were all ready chatting. We were talking about Hasselblad. We were talking about their relationship with uh, DJI, of course, who they're now partnered with. Um, we just brought some incredible innovation and we kind of slid into uh, the recording without any sensible sort of top and tail. Uh, so you kind of join us and we're already chatting a little about history and what's kind of on the horizon for this incredible camera maker's evolution. Hasselblad as a brand has been around for nearly 80 years now, you know, 1941. Um, uh, if you like, the first cameras came out, the HK7 and, and so on. And I think from a, from a company point of view, technologically, there's been a lot of challenges, you know, from film to digital. They didn't, like a lot of companies, embrace that right at the start. And so that's where the, the Imicon input came in for the, from Denmark. So I think, you know, heritage as we go, um, there, there's an awful lot of changes and challenges that we've gone through. Yeah. Um, you know, this year, obviously, is the moon landing anniversary. So when you know, one of the big things we're doing this year is looking at the heritage of that, looking at what we did with our cameras in a very short time, what modifications we made for NASA, and you know what we were able to do with our equipment to get but I, to yeah, the moon. I read up on that. It was almost an accident that you ended up in the hands of an astronaut. Yeah. I mean, it was just a little bit of serendipity. He went to a camera shop well, we and didn't, bought a camera. Yeah, well, effectively, he spoke to his colleagues and photographer friends and said, look, I've seen the quality of the images of the smaller formats that, are cut, that had flown before on a couple of the early missions, and they were quite frankly awful. Um, I need to take some high-quality pictures out of the capsule. And they said, well, use a Hasselblad. Okay, so literally one of the tech guys from NASA went down to his local Houston camera store, picked up a camera off the shelf, took it back, and NASA made some modifications to it. The first we found out was after the first few missions had taken place and, and NASA had done <laughs> these modifications. It's like, oh, okay. Um, obviously, going down the line, that involvement got much, much closer. We made specific modifications yeah. for them. And away we go. Um, I mean, if, you, if you're being humorous about that, you could point out the similarity between a 1950s and 60s organisation that threw objects into the air with your camera on the bottom 
to DJI's partnership today because <laughs> it forced you to make changes to take pictures in an environment you weren't necessarily well, used to. I think that's it. It's not necessarily forced us to make changes, but opened up new business opportunities, yeah, okay. shall we say, right. uh, or technological opportunities where we go, yeah, do you know what? We can get our equipment to go there and do that and with very little modification. You know, I won't say it's a blinkered look at what you can use a camera for, but when somebody goes, oh, you realise this has been used in space. Yeah. Really? What did you do to it? You know, and literally it was, well, not a lot actually. Um, you know, paint it black so there's no reflections. Yeah. Um, remove things that can cause a problem or uses such as viewfinders and so on. So they did all that in very short space of time. And suddenly you've got a space camera. It's like, okay. Obviously, longer term, we made specific cameras for usage, like lunar surface and so on, where there's some specific requirements that for that. Um, most, you know, the main ones really are easy to use with a glove on, um, large bulk film, and automatic advance. But other than that, it's a standard camera. You know, adjust the aperture. I mean, literally, we're taking pictures on the moon surface using the Sunny 16 rule, literally. <laughs> and, do you think, does it, does it, well, no, it can't quite apply because the atmosphere absorbs light and there's little atmosphere on the moon. So they must Not have quite that way, it. but effectively <laughs> there's three settings basically for, you know, the, the earth in a dark sky, yeah. um, sunlight and shade. And, and literally they were the three main exposure areas. How do they calculate those in advance? Just through, I mean, if you look at some of the exposures on the early missions, they could get a good, good guess on that one. So they were, they were literally guessing it, having a look at the results when they yep. got them back and yep. adjusting as they went. Yep. That's a long way. You're going to send someone to the moon to check the exposure. No, no, but if you look at the early roles that were published by uh, NASA for the early Mercury missions and so on, and then on to Gemini, I mean, you know, the exposures are a little bit ropey, shall we say, and, and obviously processing and enhancing them away you go. But you can see where exposures have improved. Um, and let's be honest, there's no viewfinder, so all of this is guesswork in terms of pointing a camera in a, in a, in a direction and hoping. took the entire viewfinder out of it. Viewfinder, mirror box, everything. Secondary shutters, all gone. Um, the shutters in the lenses were programmed to basically stay closed, so they open for the exposure and then close back down where normally, obviously, they open back up for viewing. Yeah. So modifications along those lines, easy adjustment of aperture yeah. and shutter with the, with the <laughs> wings and so on. <laughs> Strange, strange. Tell you what, after that, adapting your kit to go onto a DJI drone is going to be relatively trivial. straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> trivial. Yeah. Um, so, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm sitting here talking to you. So, let's talk about you. So, I joined Hasselblad ooh, six and a half years ago now. Um, primarily, I've worked through in terms of global training manager. Right. Uh, I've worked in parts of the sales operation for the Far East and so on, aerial. Uh, but most of my current day-to-day -day job now is global training manager. Uh, so effectively, I will look at the new products, existing products, look at what we need in terms of uh, materials to help partners. And that could be sample images, presentations, uh, or in-house movies of specific functions how to get the best from Hasselblad kit, basically. So um, you've got one of the best jobs in the world? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been really lucky with Hasselblad. Uh, you know, I've traveled the world, yeah. worked with some fantastic uh, photographers and people. Uh, and, I, and I think seeing the cameras in many, many uses that you think, oh, really? So this, it, for me, it's great because then you can look at any new project, especially with new products as and when they come along and think, okay, that's the mainstream. How could we use that? Would it work in this scenario or that scenario? So from my point of view, yeah, it's really good because you're always looking for all the other ways that we can use the equipment. Yeah, but so prior to six years ago. Yeah, basically I worked at the other end of the industry, shall we say, in terms of print. I worked for a company called Naritsu, uh, which made mini labs, photo processing oh, yeah, machines. That's what I saw, right? um, So I worked for them for ooh, 23 years, wow. roughly. Okay. Yeah. But you're also a photographer. Yeah, obviously, let's be honest, in this industry, you, you've got to be, you've got to love photography to actually understand and work within it. So from a very early age, 10, 12, I had a camera, and I've taken thousands and thousands of pictures. 
My first camera was a Zenit TTL. I mean, that's, that's going back. That's the posh one. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've got a Zenit down here somewhere. I've got the Zenit uh, ET. Oh, wow. One of those. It was the baby, the TTL had the more sophisticated exposure on it. Yeah, oh, God. a beast of a camera, but it was, you know, fantastic. Oh, I loved um, it. Helios, Helios 50mm 1. Point... <laughs> no, Helios 2, it was an F2 lens, manual focus. M42 screw threads, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I loved it. Um, I still, I, we've still, I've got two of them, because my dad bought one <laughs> when I was young, and I swore, he bought it in the year of the Moscow Olympics, whatever that year, so he's got one that's got four. the... Moscow Olympic symbol on the front because it's a Russian camera. Uh, and I swore I'd get one and I got myself a paper round. And I worked, I don't know how many years it took me, and I went down the camera shop in Mould in North Wales and they ordered me in one special. You know, as, but there's a certain, is the film wind on it has a certain noise and the shutter has a certain, it has to be a heavy camera because the shutter mechanism and the spring load is so violent. <laughs> Beautiful, great, great, great camera. But I think like most people, I mean, I, I then progressed through uh, various Olympus cameras uh, and into Canon. Uh, and then once I joined Hasselblad, I have to say I, I did migrate to uh, my own medium format system. Right. So, uh, which, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, invest into a H3D system. So. Yeah, beautiful camera. They, mm. uh, oh, they, they let me on a few years ago and I went and played with that. Great. And I still, I still think actually the... Uh, because uh, you very kindly lent me the H6D yep. and the X1D side by side. And the grip on the H series of cameras is still. And I love, don't get me wrong, I love my Nikons, you know, they fit my hands perfectly, but the grip on the H cameras is the best grip on any camera ever invented. I think you're very right. I mean, the balance that you have, just, you know, even shooting vertically, yeah. it still feels comfortable. You could hold it for a very long time before it got uncomfortable. Uh, similarly, if you look at the X1D, the grip on that, we spent a lot of time and effort sculpting that so that it gave you almost the same yeah. feeling. You know, you could hold it for hours and hours without getting cramp or anything. You know, it feels really good in the hand, so. Yeah, but there's, there is something about the head. Yes, the head six, yes. <laughs> yeah. It always terrifies me because, of course, it's the battery and you flick the, flick the little lever and pop the button and out it comes, which is terrifying. I mean, you know, you've got a 10, 15,000 pound camera swinging on your fingertips. It on itself <laughs> is now just on a clip, but it seems really solid. It's fairly secure on there, to be honest, yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, so you've come up from uh, the Zenith, yeah. which is <laughs> still Zenith, still one of my favourite cameras. Uh, Olympus, a fairly well-trodden yep. uh, OM-1, OM-10, that route, I would think. Uh, it's a Canon, which is one of the early... T90, it would have been okay. the first Canon. Okay. Um, and then 5D, my D Mark IIs and so on and from so there. There's, there's a bit of a gap between those two. Yes, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a whole technological bridge between those two. Uh, and then you picked up um, Hasselblad, which of course is medium format, which Canon, that certainly wasn't, and as far as I'm aware, there's no plans for them to go medium format. What, when you picked up uh, the H3? Well, I think when I started with uh, Hasselblad, one of the main things for me, especially as a sort of training manager was, okay, what is the big difference between a full frame camera and a medium format camera in terms of what I can achieve personally? Yeah. So I literally took identical shots in the studio of a subject and say, right, let's put them up on a computer screen and see what we've got. Yeah. Straight away, the, the difference in the color and more importantly, the transition of tones, you know, and that transition from sharp to soft. There was a particular look that you get with medium format, that beautiful transition of tone, especially, that you just couldn't get with the smaller format. And you know, it was there to see. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, ever since that day going forward, I've always said the best way for anybody to understand that medium format, why do you want it, what does it do for me, go and shoot with it, look at the results, and you know, that's it. Then it's a case of, can I afford it? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. Uh, but what in particular drew you to, I mean, uh, I don't know whether you were drawn to Hasselblad or whether a job opportunity came up and you applied for it, but you are a Hasselblad enthusiast, there's no question about that. What is it about? The Hasselblad feel and look that just is well, so beautiful. I mean, I'd used medium format previously. I had had a Bronica, to be honest, in terms of 645 film. Yeah. Um, and again, you had that, you know, 
medium format look. But from a digital medium format point of view, um, the color reproduction that the Hasselblad gives you, it, it's very neutral, accurate color. They've never gone for a, shall we say, saturated, sharpened edition. It's, here it is, here's an accurate reproduction of the scene in front of you. And there's always been a particular emphasis on making sure the skin tones are correct. Obviously that harks back to various uses of Hasselblads in the past in terms of weddings, portraits, yeah. fashion, and yeah. so on. Um, and the massive use it gets within the museum environment, reproduction environment, where actually color accuracy is king. It's gotta be right. So we start from that known position. Here it is. If you want to move off from that to whatever look you like, fantastic, you can do that. But you've got an accurate start point. Yeah. Uh, and I think for me, that accurate color, it's there. Calibrated screen, you know, uh, in use, you know where you're working from. Um, but again, in terms of that image look, for me, it was the transition of tone and that transition, even even of color tones, and obviously the the, the shallower depth of field that you would get with medium format compared to a, a smaller format sensor. Anyway, uh, it's it's much easier to get that shallow depth of field effect. Very easy um, without having to have. You know, F1.2 lenses, yeah. you just don't need it. Yeah. Uh, and that's the look that's very popular, obviously, at the moment, but it's very simple to get with medium format. Yeah, I must admit, when I picked up... So, obviously, I mean, I'm a 35mm guy. I've been... Throughout my career, I've very... I mean, I think I strayed... I think I owned an APS film. It was APC? APS film camera. Yep. Tiny little Olympus thing. And used to get the, the prints back in an odd box. <laughs> With another bit of film, or, or with your legs rolled up back into the into canister. Into the canister, yes, right. yeah. Very odd little thing. That's the only time I've ever moved away from 35mm, I think. Um, but I met, when I picked up the X1D, actually there were, there were lots of things we could talk about, but one that fascinated me was the excitement at looking at the back of the camera, <laughs> which is unreal. I mean, the, the rear display, uh, if, if, we, if we stick with the X1D on that, the whole point was it needs to be as close to what you're actually going to get out of the camera as possible yeah. because you're looking at it and you need to be able to make a decision you know, is it correct yeah. not just composition wise but is my exposure correct you know, obviously if you're using the, the, the camera you've got the EVF anyway and you're looking through there with the live view linked to the exposure meter and you can see exactly what you get but however obviously if you're shooting in a studio with the flash yeah. then, then you, you, you've got to then look at the back of the camera yeah. uh, unless you're shooting tethered obviously uh, so if we can make that rear display as, as accurate as possible it makes your life easier when you're then looking and possibly showing the client look are you happy with that is this what you're after you know but I mean, one thing um, I didn't, well, there's all sorts of threads. It's always a conversation like this. There's so many threads and I'm trying really hard to keep hold of them all so I can come back to it. Because uh, the EVF didn't strike me as being particularly accurate. Though I've never had a problem with, because I've grown up with analog cameras all my life, I don't need the EVF to show me exactly what I'm going to get. It doesn't have to be color accurate, particularly for me, because I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for the moment. It never struck me that the EVF was particularly impressive, impressive, but it did strike me that the screen on the back was to the point where I got excited about images, portraits I was taking, and I started to show Your my client. clients, which yeah. I've never done before. I mean, obviously the, the EVF, within the constraints of, of the actual EVF module, um, the color range at the time we released the camera was very good. And we tried to make sure that it's as close as we possibly could get it. Uh, but the, yeah, the rear display, obviously, it's much easier, a larger area for a start to look at, and it's much easier to actually give you a, a, a controlled color there. Technology moves on, however, you know, and you know, if we were making the camera again today, there would be a completely different EVF in there and away you go. So, um, <laughs> you know, just if you look at where technology's gone, look at the, the new Panasonic yeah. uh, with the five and a half megapixel EVF. I mean... Yeah, I had to play on one of those, uh, the <laughs> photographer show, the S1. Um, the tool was they gave it to us cold to do a one hour on the stand demo each photographer we did and it was tethered so there's no there's no i'll show you this one and i won't show you that one every image was live so the easy bit it was a traditional camera so once i set up the lights and the exposure everything was secure the hard bit 
I think it was too clever for me. I think it had eye tracking on it. And the trouble is, as a professional photographer, as opposed to an amateur, an amateur will lock onto the face and stay there. You talk to any professional photographer, once it's focused, they look all the way around the edge of the frame and the focus kept focusing on the background. So every time I thought I'd get in a sharp image and I had to kind of force myself to look, once I got it set, look straight into the guy's eyes or the, the model's eyes <laughs> to look. And I think given another half an hour of the camera, I'd have turned all of that off. I mean, the quality was amazing. The displays were amazing. The photos coming off the camera were amazing. Um, it, this isn't a knock at that. It was a knock at the fact they gave me this ridiculous level of automation. <laughs> it completely screwed in my head. It was very funny. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Uh, sort of going on to, you mentioned tethering. And an observation I had was that the, if the camera, you, Hasselblad at the moment, and this isn't a dig, so please don't take it that way. I'm, I'm actually a, a big fan, so this, this is all kind of mm. the degree of affection. It always feels like you've got different people working on different bits of your ecosystem. So focus the software that sits on a computer. Yep. Clunky, not particularly intuitive. It feels out of date to, to me. Focus on an iPhone or focus on an iPad. Amazing. So, I mean, I did it because when you, you um, very kindly put the cameras in my hands, what I did was what I said I'd do, which is just use it. I put my Nikons to bed. <laughs> Apart from when I did, I did, actually, that's not wholly true. I did a wedding in the middle and there's no way I'm risking a live job like that. Oh. But I was shooting in the local gym and I took the Hasselblads with me. Uh, and, uh, you know, little bits and pieces that were, I had to kind of think through because I, for a start, I had different len lens lengths and the optical... Um, considerations were slightly different, but I stuck my iPhone on the counter while I was shooting and tethered to it over the network, set it as a hotspot and tethered over the network. It glitched a couple of times, which is irritating, but other than that, it felt like a thoroughly modern ecosystem. And I think there's a little bit about that in Hasselblad. So the H6, much as it's my favorite battery grip, or favorite grip, feels like it feels like a legacy camera. An X1D feels like a 21st century camera, even though I know the innards are essentially the same. So, yeah. And is that something you kind of feel is part of just Hasselblad? Or? Yeah, well, if you think the, the H system has been around since around 2002, and it's, it's modified as we've gone through. Sensor technology is the main increase, and obviously the electronic platform changes to keep up with that. Uh, so that you end up where we are now with a H6 with you know, a touch interface that is very similar to a smartphone, really. Uh, is it true you brought smartphone designers in to help you put that together? We took ideas from that, yeah. <laughs> um, everybody's used to it, you know, from double tapping yeah. to zoom and so on, swiping. It's, everybody uses it now, so it's very intuitive. There's no training required yeah. on that. Um, however, if you look at the H system, it's very much, should we say, more geared to a let's say studio environment in terms of that's where its legacy was. Yeah. Um, obviously it's, you can take it out, don't get me wrong, it's weather sealed and so on, there's no issues there. But in terms of, if you look at the USB connection, you know, it's an internal, much stabler connection. Uh, you've got then that modularity that we, you know, you can literally take the back off if you want to put it on a technical camera and so on. There's a waist level finder. So that if you're using it on a, re, a repro stand, it's easier to set up. Yeah. But obviously you've got the desktop version of Focus, which is, effectively a very very good high-end raw converter yeah. it doesn't shout to be any more than that you know we, there's no image management and so on it's just a very very good raw converter with a lot of tools that are you know, by default they're switched off because not everybody uses them and i think this is the issue that once you start needing specific high-end tools they're there in focus and you suddenly think well actually this is a very good yeah. piece of software if you just want to get in and use it as a very quick raw converter um, you know, the layout is, is very similar to Lightroom in terms of, you know, literally the on-screen layout. Um, so it's very user-friendly, I feel, from that point of view. You could look at it from a Lightroom user's point of view and go, oh, yeah, this is where everything is. Um, so I think over the last two or three years especially, we've, we've added many, many tools that make focus a lot more user-friendly and a lot more powerful, you know, from Keystone and so on, adjustment layers. So there's a lot more tools in there that people expect as, as standard. Yeah. Um, and obviously that takes time and money to actually develop all of that to bring it to the market. 
Um, bear in mind that it's actually a free piece of software. Um, yeah. You just so, set this focus on an iPad and it focused on the iPad was brilliant. <laughs> and it was simple. I mean, I'm not saying it had lots of tools. It was just, as a working photographer, I put it on, literally, I, I propped my phone up on the yep. counter where I was working yep. and I was showing my client what we were doing. And I'm not a big fan of this. So no. I, I don't normally shoot tethered because in this environment, all that happens is the beautiful moment I've got evolving in front of me becomes a, have you taken it yet? Let's go all have a look. And you, <laughs> you have this kind of odd thing of people walking backwards and forwards. So I don't do it. But in a context where I've got the client stood next to me and I've got my models in the gym ahead of me, yep. it was phenomenal. And, and it was I mean, it glitched a couple of times, but it was phenomenal. And, and I think that's the whole point of Focus Mobile, that you strip out everything other than the, the basically, the, it's the yeah. capture control. Yeah. Have I got it? Is the composition right? Let's take the picture. Um, you know, and that could be, you could be setting up a, a, a copy stand and you've got a remote view because you can't physically look through the camera, you know. So, but for you, for that client interface, it's brilliant because yeah. it may not be iPhone, it could be a nice big iPad Pro, you know. I, did, I know, I did take my yeah. iPad Pro as well, but and it was just, the, the first time I tried it, I just had my iPhone 10 sat in a corner and it was great, just because it was somebody else looking at it. And, it, you know, I could hold onto the camera and say, what do you think? And literally, I haven't moved, just what do you think? And, and that's exactly what, it, you know, it, it, it's designed for. So you can say, I'm sure you can control the camera through it if you yeah. wanted to, but as a, a client viewing tool, it's great. I was just, I think, I, I don't know why I was so impressed with it, because there's tons of those around. Yeah. It just was, I don't know, it, even with a couple of glitches, it just felt really quick and responsive did exactly what it said on the tin because it's part of the native ecosystem. There's none of that, oh, it's not talking to each other. It did glitch. I did have a problem, but it- And obviously that's evolved over time because the yeah. original Focus Mobile used to, to link to the desktop app right. um, until there was Wi-Fi in the cameras. And once that came along, then obviously you were dealing directly with the information from the camera. So that has jumped in terms of its usefulness. But it was it was good, you know, and, and even, even down to the image acuity that we're getting across the Wi-Fi, quite rapid rate. <laughs> It was it was uh, it was quite impressive, and, and I think in the end, the thing for me that I was most addicted to um, was was the image quality that came off, uh, and it came out into the files. But the interface itself, I was intrigued by, um, because it it I can't I couldn't work out whether it was a breath of fresh air to have almost no buttons and have a mobile phone interface, or whether it was irritating to have almost no buttons and a mobile phone in, interface. And I think the former. I think probably it's one that you just get so used to it, you'll crave it and miss it when you go back to a different... Unit. I think that's it. You know, the vast majority of people will probably tell you that the, the simpler the better. They just want very basic interface that if they want to change some basic settings on the camera, they can. Yeah. But they're getting, a, you know, a 30 frames a second live view on there. They're happy with what they're getting. They can review the captures as they come in in, in a fairly rapid yeah. rate. Um, and it's, again, going to be an accurate display on there to show you this is exactly what the camera's captured. Yeah. What drove the decision to make the lenses a different, slightly different format to the full... Um, the, For the X-Series. The X-Series. Sorry, I, I'm fumbling over my words, but you know what I mean. Yeah. But obviously, with, with the... Uh, you know, obviously, the H system, the original HC lenses were designed to cover the full 645 right. film format. And then they brought out the HCD variants, which were, again, slightly smaller, lighter, yeah. which were uh, designed to cover the slightly smaller sensor format yeah. to keep the weight down, etc. Then with the X, because we'd gone to all of that trouble to basically make the body as small and light and compact as we possibly can, it seemed we had to bring out lenses which were specifically designed for that mirrorless format. And again, we could make them smaller and lighter. I mean, again, there's a limit to how small and light you can make the lenses because you've got a shutter in there um, and it, effectively they still have to cover that medium format uh, sensor. Yeah. But we could make them that much smaller. Uh, obviously with the adapters and so on, you can still use your H lenses. We just we use the adapter effectively as a spacer for the missing camera body. Yeah. But with the XCD lenses, it gave us a chance to then revisit Here's the size of sensor we're going to work with within this camera body. Let's design our optics specifically for that sensor and this distance. Um, and, and the lens designer, Per Norland, and his team 
you know, they've done an excellent job in terms of giving us some fantastic optics for that particular yeah. unit. Uh, so if you were, you know, saying to, I mean, this podcast really is aimed at portrait photographers and to, to a degree, I guess we've got an awful lot of wedding photographers who listen in. If you were balancing out and saying, well, um, firstly, why would I upgrade to medium format? And then I'll allow you to put a sales pitch in. Uh, why, why not? There's no point. I mean, I'll do the same. You know, if I, t if I talk to Fuji, they're going to have exactly the same sales pitch. Uh, why, why would I go medium format? And then why, why specifically would I choose Hasselblad, yeah. Hasselblad <laughs> over all others? Well, I think if we start with the basic in terms of why would I go medium format? Uh, there is, as, as we said earlier, there is a, a specific look that a medium format sensor will give you, um, you know, with a, a set lens, compare the same capture with a smaller sensor, say full frame or, or APS-C and so on, with an equivalent focal length. The medium format will just give you um, a much nicer transition of, of, of tones and from sharp into out of focus, it's a much smoother, nicer transition. So that, that may be of, of real good use to you as a portrait yeah. photographer and yeah. so on. Uh, as we said earlier, the color accuracy for medium format, um, just the higher bit depth that generally you have available on the sensors, you, you have more colors to work with from the start. Um, also the larger sensor gives you a wider dynamic, dynamic range. So. We've why? all had those opportunities where you're, you're why? shooting. Why? Why? Why does a larger sensor give me your higher? Not specifically range? a larger sensor. Generally, larger pixels, and I think that's the important thing. Basically, the photo sites are bigger. Yeah, so they're bigger. So think of it as a, as a bigger bucket, so I can have more signal in there. Right. Um, that coupled with obviously the the analog to digital conversion within the sensor itself. So I have a wider dynamic range, generally 14 to 15 stops, depending on which sensor you're talking about. Uh, you have that higher bit depth as well. And I think, you know, we've all had that opportunity where we're shooting against the, the, the window, you've got a burnt out window or to, to make sure you've got detail in the shadows and the face. So it just allows you to have more data captured so that then in post, if you need to, you, you've got the data there, you can tweak it back in to get those levels to the point where you like. So that's, if you like them, the standard medium format, generic for anybody, whether it be, you know, phase one Fuji, us, whatever. Um, they're the benefits. When we come to, well, why would I choose Hasselblad over the others? Um, probably, and you can't say just because you're wearing a Hasselblad shirt. No, no, no. It's for me. It's down to color reproduction, and uh, that Hasselblad image quality, the, the the look and feel. Again, unfortunately, it's very very difficult to describe it. Normally, people see it and do a comparison and go, "Okay, yes, I can understand that." So again, we have gone for a, a set look within our image that comes out of pretty much any of our cameras. So you can take that image, you'll get a very, very accurate color out of that. But it's that tweaked Hasselblad color. Yeah. You know, because as we, we discussed earlier on, we're all using the same sensor uh, from, from pretty much from Sony other than uh, Leica. So basically we've got that sensor coming through we all go through, in terms of the X1D, it's a 14-bit analog to digital conversion. Uh, with, the, with the larger 100 megapixel, obviously, it's just, you've got the option of true 16-bit. We then take that data and we, we remap it into the Hasselblad color space uh, and, and tweak that to give that look that we want. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why the X1D has got such a good score on the DxO. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was reading that with interest this morning. Yeah, because it's that extra work that we do with that uh, data that we read off the sensor and convert that just gives you that much nicer color. Uh, it's, again, very subjective. Obviously, there are people out there that will prefer a different style of image quality straight out of the camera because, yeah. let's be honest, any of the results you can tweak to get pretty much whatever you want once you get it into the computer. Yeah. But it's that, if you can get it there, at capture, show the client and go, there you go. Yeah. That's the finished result you're yeah. gonna get. You, you shouldn't need to do any more than that. Yeah, I've got a curiosity. I take all of that, and while you were talking, I was, it occurred to me, 
that the X1D isn't really like any other camera I've seen. It, it, I, I don't know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, but I, was, I was a musician for a long time and I remember the Korg M1 keyboard appearing on the market, right? It was designed by Porsche and every other keyboard looked technical. It had banks of this and rows and levers and all sorts of things. And then the Korg M1, I'm sure it's the M1, somebody will correct me if it's not, arrived, it had rounded corners and it was beautiful to look at. You didn't have to turn the power on. The menus are well structured. It had round buttons, not square buttons. The whole thing, design, it looks like if you sat in a 911, it looked like the inside of a 911. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful styling. The X1D is a little bit like that. It's kind of, it's not like a normal camera. Well, very much so. And, you know, to a certain extent, even if you looked at the previous H models, they're similar in terms of their, their lack of bells and whistles on the outside of the camera. Yeah. There's a lot of technology buried deep. But if you look at the X1D, it was designed to be a very clean design with just the main functions available through the buttons that are there in terms of, you know, white balance, AF support, um, AE lock and so on. Yeah. So just the main things you need. Obviously, there's, there's favorites in the menu so you can get to other functionality, but we wanted to keep it as clean, as simple as possible because yeah. the camera's supposed to be a tool to do the job. It shouldn't be all these bells and whistles yeah. covering the outside with lots yeah. of things to play with. It's, it's there to allow you to take a high quality photograph. But, but oddly enough, you see, I've always, people ask me, you know, we still next to someone at a wedding and they'll have a camera and I've got my camera and they'd be like, you know, we've got, I've got a, my go-to lens is a 70 to 200, 2.8, normal journalist lens. Of course we all use it because it's sharp and it's versatile. And I'm holding, I don't know how many kilos of kit and it's laced with buttons. And then I look at the lens, so, but that'll zoom in a long way. And I'll be like, no, actually yours will zoom far closer than this will. You know, well, what's the difference? Why do you buy all of that kit? Well, I buy it because actually, if you look at all the buttons on the back, everything has a function. It means I never have to go into a menu. Everything is just there at my fingertips. I play it like a, like, just like a keyboard. When I was using the X1D, I never felt like that. Oddly, that was a limitation. I, I have done. I've, I've, to do a demo on uh, mastering portrait photography, I borrowed my son's camera uh, and Nikon D little letters, something. Yep. Um, and it was a nightmare because every time I wanted to change something, I had to go into about eight delved menus. The X1D, you've managed to get around that. You've still got a ridiculously simple physical interface and a, a very intuitive digital interface on the screen. I can get to everything, and I did get to everything quickly and efficiently. Once I learned what it was, I didn't know where everything was. Yeah. You've managed to do what I didn't think you could, which is to take the physicality, the need to have access quickly, the camera and the grip and everything, and give me access to the bits I don't use every day, but when I do, I need them now, and bring it all together. And I think, I think it's quite groundbreaking. I don't know that necessarily it's talked about in that way, but I keep, I'm trying to think of another camera that has that. They, they have, yes, there are cameras with few buttons on, but their menu system is atrocious. You know, yes, there are cameras that are milled out of single pieces of aluminium, but they don't have the style. I mean, you're almost doing to cameras what Apple did to, to computers. Yeah, and yeah, computers. yeah. I, I think there was a lot of time and effort put into the X1D design in terms of its, you know, its build quality. As I said earlier on, the, the, the grip, so many iterations on that design to make it, you know, not just for a particular size of hand, shall we say, but it would suit a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, you know, the distance to the buttons and so on. We tried to make it as, as you know, uh, simple for uh, many, many sizes of hand, shall we say, to reach the functions. Yeah. Uh, also, a lot of time when effort went into, okay, well, what are the main functions we feel that should be on here? But also given the option for you to then modify that, if you felt that, you know, the spirit level was your main function, you can put that on the favorites. Yeah. Uh, so I think that configurability was what sold yeah. us on that interface. And again, being the touch interface, it made life so much easier and the icon based as opposed to menus. I mean, there are menus on the X1D if you really want to get into them, but the whole point is here are your main functions and they're very, very simple to get at. Yeah. Um, you know, and as 
firmware updates have added functionality over time. You know, now we're using the rear display when you're using the EVF as the touchpad to move the AF point around. Yes, you know. so that, that was great. So just to make life that a little bit quicker and simpler. Um, and Part of the fact I've got a big nose, and so <laughs> occasionally it did move on its own, which... I think if you you can specify which area on the rear <laughs> yeah, display, I did so find it probably, in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I slapped it. I've got an EVF. Why is my focus point moving? It's my nose. What can I tell you? Yeah. I have a big nose. It is a beautiful bit of kit. I mean, there's no question about that. It's a beautiful bit of kit. And as I'm sitting here talking about it, because I've always been a fan of the H cameras. Uh, I was I was lent one. It was many years ago. It was an H. It might well have been an H two. I mean, we're going way back. But it was just, I didn't like the display on the back. The display on the back was terrible, but the, the images that came off it, once you got the memory card out, were just out of this world. I, I think that's it. I mean, the X1D was specifically designed to offer people who wanted to, to travel with the camera a lot, shall we say, or carrying yeah. it around, um, to have a smaller, lighter weight option where they didn't need to be able to, you know, change the viewfinder or... or put a film back on or whatever. They didn't need that. Actually, the, the, the lighter camera with the lighter lenses meant more to them in terms of traveling around than actually all these other functionality. But the important thing was that the sensor and the quality you yeah. get from that gives you a result that's no different to if you were using a H system. And that was the important thing. Yeah. So that if you compared images taken, you'd have to go to the metadata to find out which one took it. Yeah. You, you've definitely got more Apple than Apple. <laughs> uh, I know you can't talk about an awful lot of what's coming up in the future, but what's coming up in the future? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, unfortunately, we can't talk about uh, products. Like that. I really, really can't. Um, we, we're always working on new technology that's coming through. Obviously, you know, sensors are always updated and so on from Sony. And sure, we, we will bring out new products when they're actually ready and the time yeah. is right. Um, as opposed to just quickly bring them to market, you know. Well, I very much look forward to seeing whatever's in the pipeline. And I'm, I'm you know, I think when I heard the announcement, no, I don't think there was an announcement. When I heard, <laughs> heard the since confirmed rumours that DJI had invested in that partnership, I was one of the people that was probably quite excited about it because just the mechanics of business say that's probably a good thing. And I, th I think so far, if the X1D is anything to go by, that seems to be the case. I think so. Let, let's be brutally honest. The partnership between DJI and ourselves is is a very good one. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it works two ways. If you look with the new Mavic Pro, yeah, 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 with yeah. the Hasselblad camera on there, so it's it's a technology share, a resource share, yeah. and you know, for us, it's but, great. But that, 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 you know, I think I think from what we've seen so far, at least in its early days, you know, an investment program like this can be anywhere. You know, you're looking at five years for the first round, and then see what happens. Um, they don't always work, you know. I mean, I know Sony's eyes, Panasonic, Leica, and these hookups, and they, they have varying degrees of. I, I think, you know, obviously the, the, the partnership, strategic partnership, is, has been very good for us. Um, and importantly, Hasselblad still is a standalone company yeah. uh, run from Sweden. So they, they, it works very, very well for us. You've got access to some very big resources, some exactly. very big airborne resources. Which is, is all, I think, quite exciting. I think so. And if you look, you know, there's, there's a couple of products, as we said, the Mavic Pro 2 yep. with the Hasselblad camera. You've got the M600 uh, with the H system or the Aerial A6D can be mounted on it. And it's fully integrated into the DJI yeah. app. So as you can see, there's a lot of technology share and integration there. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's really exciting. And I, I want, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what comes down comes down the pipe and uh, get my sticky paws on it, given your headquarters is about 20 minutes away. <laughs> I'm, 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 lucky. Close. I'm very <laughs> lucky. And, uh, I, reckon, I reckon if I put, if I, if I rang at the right time, I'd get my hands on something to play with. Uh, and I'm betting on that. Um, tell me a couple of bits. Just I, We always round off the podcast. Constant effort. I am building. Uh, they, they, as I heard this on, they did, there's a thing called, um, I can't remember the program is, but basically you have to bring an exhibit for a museum. It's a, it's a okay. virtual thing on Radio yeah, yeah. 4. Comedy program, actually. And I got the idea from that, uh, which is that I am now building a virtual photographic, a, a photography book library. And in fact, in a very real sense, because I'm, if I find a book that's of the right price that somebody tells me about, I'm then going and buying it. So tell me a good, a, a, a photography book you'd recommend to put in my ever-expanding library of photography greats. 
that's a real difficult one. But for me, um, maybe not a, a specific how-to book, but uh, I very much like the work of, say, Patrick de Yeah, I love his work. And, you know, I have his Dior book and what is portrait books. And for inspiration, that's, those are the two yeah. that I like to look at to actually think, oh, yes, let's try that. Yeah. Uh, perfect. That's a perfect answer. Uh, my favourite book uh, to date is the book of Vogue. Ooh. It's, it's just, it goes from about 1940-something all the way up to, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know which edition, I've got 2008 or something. But it's full from front to back of stories and pictures. So it's not a technique book, it's just a... It's a so, visual book of yeah, the changes just, through time. I just time. pick it up and there's, oh my goodness, look what they were doing back in 1972. <laughs> I'm dreaming this up on the top of my head. Uh, and I love that picture and I'll, I'll take it, sometimes I'll take a picture of my iPhone and next time, just before I have a family in, I'll just have a quick look at stuff that I'm being influenced by. I think, you know, if they have this kind of look, wouldn't it be nice Let's to try take a picture this. that's yep. influenced like that? And we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, how you draw on um, influences because you do, do we do that is that we, we do take I'll walk into the studio thinking I've seen this picture I'm going to take that picture I never do you, you kind of start there and within two shots you're already doing your own thing well away from what it was you went in I there. think that's it normally when you look at an image uh, it'll be oh I wonder how that's lit yeah. you know how can I get that effect yeah. but that's your starting point yeah then you'll be modifying the background or the lighting fall off and, and that'll be your take on that. Yeah. And I think that's part of that photographic journey, how you learn, isn't yeah. it? Moving forward, that's where I started from. Let's try this. And then you get a certain look and feel that is you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it fascinates me. Um, I brought someone into the studio the other day to take a very specific picture because I didn't know how the photographer had done it. So I found someone, uh, it's a fitness picture, so it needs someone who's athletic got them in the studio and she was like what are you going to do that so we're going to do this picture but i lay with bet actually that won't be what we end up with but i'm gonna we're gonna and i did that as we actually figured out the picture within about five frames but because i'd got her in the studio and we've got the whole rig and the light in then we kind of wandered off and created some much much better pictures in my opinion than my version of uh, this first picture. Well, you, you, you got the image that they wanted and then it was a case of that's done, it's in the bag, tick that's the it. box and let's see yeah, what else we can produce. We, we played and it was absolutely brilliant. Well, Chris, it has been an absolute pleasure. I knew it would be because uh, I've enjoyed... So we've met, I think we've met three times now. This is the third meeting. Yep. Um, so I knew, but I knew just from talking to you, you know, I've, it's fascinating to talk to someone who's really technical and understands it, uh, but also has a true appreciation of photography and what all this technology Used means, for. Yeah, in the hands of an artist, you know, it's like someone that understands the chemistry of oil paints. <laughs> making this up, <laughs> but you get my you get my point. Yeah. You know, the tools that are there are meant to help us, and I think uh, I certainly, from the experience I've had with Hasselblad, that's certainly true. Uh, you're a lovely guy, and it's lovely to talk with who's both technical and really easy to talk to. Uh, so thank you for your time. I hope so uh, the Hex One D continues to sell well, and I look forward to the partnership with you and DJI producing some really interesting stuff in the future. Lovely, thank you very much. Oh, what an absolute gentleman. If you get the chance to talk to Chris, he's one of the nicest guys in the industry, supremely knowledgeable. He's actually a great photographer in his own right. Just Google Chris Coos Photography and you'll find his website. Uh, but a tremendous guy, a very knowledgeable guy, but also someone that's very easy to sit and talk to. So a big, big thank you uh, to him for coming and being a guest on the podcast. Um, incidentally, I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here doing the footnotes to the podcast with my Zenit EM. It was an EM uh, camera in my hands. Now listen to this. That, that kids is the noise of manual film. Well, it, would, it would be film with us film in it, but what a beautiful noise that is as you wind it on, set the springs, and then uh, trigger it at some point. This thing, I think, would probably still work. It was, it's built like a tank. I doubt there's anything wrong with it. Um, I need to uh, put some film in there and see if we can't take a few pictures uh, just for the sheer joy of the thing. I know you can actually get Helios adapters for Nikon, uh, which means my Helios 50mm manual um, lens, my Russian bit of lens would sit squarely on the front of my D5. I don't know whether there's any point in doing that, but it might be fun to try. Uh, during the podcast, Chris mentioned 
a photographer called Patrick de Michelier. I'm not sure it comes across that clearly, but it's de Michelier. Uh, I will put the link to him as an author and as a photographer in the bio notes for the podcast. Some beautiful books. They're going to make a wonderful addition to our ever expanding uh, photographer's library. I'm not sure I'll be buying those ones physically just at the moment because they seem to be pretty expensive, but nonetheless, uh, they are beautiful and I can see exactly why uh, Chris likes those images. And if you fancy having a look at his work, uh, just Google Chris Coo's photography, you'll find him. Uh, you can see some of that influence. Uh, so on that happy note, I hope, I really do genuinely hope you've enjoyed uh, this podcast. There were so many things I wished I'd asked Chris. Of course there are. Um, but you kind of get carried away in a conversation and I hope that I've ticked all the boxes and it was still interesting, uh, even to those of you who are not necessarily contemplating heading across to medium format anytime soon. But if you have enjoyed this podcast, uh, please do let us know. There's various ways of doing it. Of course, you can simply email me. We had some lovely emails this week. Apologies to anyone I haven't got back to, uh, but I've actually been out of the country for the past fortnight. And on top of that, I managed to break an iPhone, uh, which has been this week's Sorry Adventure. Uh, so please do leave us a review. The best place to is probably on iTunes, uh, but we'll find you if you leave us a nice review, a nice star rating somewhere, we'll normally find them. Um, and it also helps other people find us. Also, if you like the podcast, please do recommend us to others. We're trying to grow a big old community around our website, Mastering Portrait Photography, and independently of that, this podcast, Mastering Portrait Photography. We use the same name because uh, the book, which is still selling, ladies and gentlemen, four years later, uh, it is still selling really well. Um, uh, so we've built everything around this one particular idea of getting your head around portrait photography, mastering uh, portrait photography. Uh, so do share it with other like-minded souls. Um, you can subscribe, of course. That's the best way to make sure you never miss an episode. And who'd want to miss an episode? Of course, the minute we record one, you want to get out there and uh, have a listen. Best way of doing that is, of course, to subscribe. You can do that on wherever you uh, gather your podcast uh, audio from, uh, whether it's on Podbeam, which is one of the homes of this podcast, iTunes, Spotify, uh, Radio Public, Stitcher, and of course, the home of the podcast itself, which is masteringportraitphotography.com. If you head across there, all of the episodes are available, though you cannot actually subscribe because we don't have an app as such, not on the website. Anyway, everything is there. And if you have any ideas for somebody uh, you'd like us to talk to, an idea we'd just like, you'd just like me to chat about quietly in one of my evenings or on the out on the road musings, uh, then please do let us know. We can be reached at paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. That's paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. UK. Uh, and happily, we will take suggestions. If you think the podcast is good, leave us a review. If things we, things you think we could improve, well, why not just email me? Um, and again, I know I've been uh, slightly slow to respond just at the moment, but we normally do get there. So until next time, I've got a long trip out tomorrow in our brand new Land Rover. I will keep you posted as to how that goes. You never know. I might even record a podcast on the road. But until next time, remember, be kind to yourself. Take care. Take care.